Again, hello and welcome to, to, to Inside Intelligence, brought to you by the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program and Advanced Academic Programs here at Johns Hopkins University. We're joined today by Jay Oki for a discussion on harnessing alternative analysis to hunt strategic surprises. My name is Peter Huggins, and I'm the moderator of today's and host of today's edition. Please note that today's session will be recorded and uploaded to the Inside Intelligence playlist on our YouTube channel. During the session, if you have any questions, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom, and we'll get to everyone's questions over the next hour. With that, I'll turn the program over to our host and moderator, Dr. Michael Ard, who is the program director and senior lecturer for the Intelligence Analysis Program. Michael. Thank you very much, Peter, and welcome everyone. Uh, in January, we hosted uh, Professor John Mueller of the Ohio State University, who talked uh, about his contrarian approach to political science and international relations themes. And today, we're also going to be talking a little bit about uh, alternative approaches. With us is Jay Oki, who served as an intelligence analyst with the CIA and the National Intelligence Council for 35 years helping senior policymakers grapple with national security challenge across a range of issues and a run of history from the Cold War to COVID. Among various roles, he has worked high priority country accounts, helped produce the US intelligence community's 20 year strategic assessment known as global trends, led analysis for innovative open source analytics startup and served as the chief of CIA's analytic unit Challenging Key Assumptions to Hunt for Strategic Surprises, which is gonna be his theme today. Now retired from the US government, he offers his own services through Free Think Consulting to help organizations identify practical ways to bolster their own risk assessment frameworks through the use of indicators, alternative analysis, scenarios, simulation exercises, and more engaging analytic storytelling. Thank you very much, Jay, for being with us today on the program. Hey, Michael, thank you for uh, having me and uh, greetings to everybody out there signing in in this uh, uh, new world uh, platform of uh, uh, virtual exchanges and communication. I tell you what, uh, Peter, if you can call up the first slide here, we are gonna dive right in. And I'm gonna start by telling you the whole thesis and background of my point here. We'll give uh, Peter a second to pull that up from the first. There we go. All right. Well, the business where I come from, we talk about the bottom line up front, where we just tell people what our main thesis is before we ever get going. And so here's mine for today. Surprises are more frequent and bigger than we think. And there are reasons, good reasons, why we struggle to see these surprises. And so we need to push ourselves to expand our circle of plausibility if we are going to get better at anticipating major disruptions and discontinuities. All right, uh, next slide there, please. Global history in the modern era is punctuated by an amazing array of surprises and discontinuities. The Great Depression, World War II, Pearl Harbor, the Korean War, Sputnik, Russian hydrogen bomb, Russian missiles in Cuba, the Arab-Israeli wars, OPEC oil embargo, fall of the Shah of Iran, Iranian hostage crisis, HIV AIDS, fall of the Berlin Wall, collapse of the USSR, India and Pakistan, launching nuclear weapons, testing nuclear weapons, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, color revolutions, 2008 financial crisis, Arab Spring, ISIS takeover, parts of Iraq and Syria, the COVID pandemic that's come out. History is defined by a succession of almost mind-boggling surprises that erupt on a regular basis. And in fact, one might go so far as to argue that these events, these surprises, these strate strategic eruptions actually primarily define the contours 
of national security for the United States and many other countries around the world. So the idea that these are not occasional irritations, occasional inconveniences that happen, these are the major provocations that shape the direction and course of history that go on. Now, this topic resonates with me because I worked in intelligence for 35 years before retiring two years ago. Worked from the analytic ranks, wide variety of, of topics and backgrounds and things. And I experienced accounts I worked on in which I missed major surprises. They were on my account. I missed them. I also watched colleagues and the organization that I was part of at the agency struggle to keep up with major difficulties and challenges of its own over time. And then, as Michael mentioned, uh, close to my heart, seven of my 35 years I spent either as the deputy chief or chief of CIA's Red Cell, uh, an analytic unit dedicated to the purpose of identifying strategic surprises through alternative analysis, through challenging assumptions, expectations uh, that people had. So my talk today is really to highlight reasons why it is important, offering some practical suggestions on how you can integrate it uh, into your own work. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, I'm gonna consolidate a lot of points down here in, in one simple slide. There are reasons why we struggle to recognize and anticipate these major discontinuities. Uh, cognitive bias. I suspect a lot of you, if you're taking the time and effort to check in uh, to this, if you're in the master's program, if you think about these issues, you are well aware of the idea that our minds are wired in such ways that often give us a predilection for seeing things one way instead of another, jumping to conclusions, filling in facts that aren't there, seeking out facts that confirm our expectations while discounting or dismissing those that don't. The slide on the left there, uh, that may look like some high-powered new resolution of a far-reaching cosmos uh, probe that has gone out there those aren't planets. Those are not planets of Saturn or Jupiter. Those are the bottoms of six cooking pots. And yet your mind, when you see that, processes it as some picture of space, some snapshot of various planets or orbs that are out there. Our minds are wired in a way that are built for storytelling. They're built for pattern recognition. And when it comes to discontinuities, it can give us a disadvantage. Those biases can help in a lot of circumstances, but when things go sideways, they can serve us uh, 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 ill. Another element on that beyond our own cognitive biases has to do with sort of the social group cultural aspects of getting together in organizations, groupthink, as you may know about it. Uh, oddly enough, you have sheep out in a pasture somewhere, and most uh, folks observe over time that at some point, all of the sheep will end up pointing in the same direction. If a group tackles a problem, they come to understand it in similar terms, they come to talk about it in similar terms, the assumptions they have tend to be a, a shared element. It gets to the point where understandings of an issue as an organization become a way of bonding and identity to the point where questioning those assumptions, questioning those expectations, questioning those forecasts can be seen as questioning the identity and integrity of the group itself. Again, patterns and characteristics that can really limit our ability to see things uh, uh, when we're in, in organizations. Finally, there's a simple matter of, uh, of personality, ego, id. Um, over the course of my career, one might often hear, oh, you know, we had a big intelligent surprise, but I wasn't working on the account then. I wouldn't have missed that, but the people that were working on it did. 
or well, we may have missed that, but these were judgments we really inherited from other people. Or, or well, actually, we may have missed that, but the fact is everybody missed that. And so these things just happen from time to time, and you know how that is. Or, well, actually, we thought of that possibility, but and we put that in an appendix on page 294 as a footnote. And so if somebody had read that, they would have known that this was possible. Uh, now, as fantastical as a lot of those excuses might sound, I can assure you I heard or recited some version of those over the entire course of my career, many, many times. A natural reflex, something happens, we miss something, and there's some effort to discount it, dismiss it, explain it away, or point the finger at someone else. And that's just very natural uh, on things. Uh, let's go with the next slide then. So given these impediments, given the cognitive bias, given the number of surprises we have to deal with, given the challenges we have personally, organizationally, uh, uh, psychologically to deal with that, the simple observation is we've really got to push ourselves hard to expand our circle of plausibility. What we think is plausible, if you, if you think about the litany of global disruptions that I talked about, any one of those were a good two to three standard deviations beyond what almost anybody would have imagined at the time. Picture yourself in January of 2020 and some organization, it's a government, it's a business, it's a think tank, they sit down and they say, hey, give us a five-year look at some of the big things that we ought to be concerned about. And if you had had the premonition to write down and say, well, we're going to have inflation come back in the first time in a generation. We're going to have great power competition at its most highest level that we've had in 60 years. We're going to have a global pandemic that happens uh, uh, for, uh, on a scale that we haven't seen in 100 years. And we're going to have a great power invade a major European country. And all of that's going to happen in the next year or two. Had you offered that assessment, people would have laughed so hard, milk would have come out their noses. Any one of those happening, the odds of which seemed small to infinitesimal, the idea that they might all converge at one time is just almost beyond human comprehension. And yet, as the cool kids say, here we are. And so one of the lessons of history, if we choose to reflect, uh, 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 inculcate some, some humility in, on our part, is our need to expand our circle of plausibility of what we can imagine and think of that is actual, actually po possible to happen. And so what I wanna talk about now are some very specific suggestions uh, about things that you can incorporate in terms of the analytic work that you do, the kind of mindset that you have uh, uh, about things. Uh, Peter, if we could go to the next slide there, please. Make a sign. Now, this may seem ridiculously simplistic to you, but if you've watched Ted Lasso, who came up with the believe sign and put it above his door, I'm actually a believer that seeing things and being reminded of things can be helpful. Expect the unexpected. Put up something to remind yourself every day, every week, every month. Things happen that turn out differently than we expect. Uh, next slide, please. Make lists. Make lists 
of things like, what has surprised you in the last year? What are things that might surprise you in the next year? What are things that you couldn't afford to miss? What are assumptions that you have that you ought to be thinking about and, and testing? Uh, back when I was on the National Intelligence Council uh, some years back and we were doing the Global Trends Project, uh, we organized uh, a round robin with all of the regional and functional teams in which we'd sit down with them for an hour and literally brainstorm lists like this. What are things that surprised you in the last year? What's been the most surprising developments in the last decade? What might that look like in the next five or 10 years looking out? An exercise, a discipline, a way to remind yourself again and again to sort of push and think about other possibilities. Uh, next sl slide, please, uh, Peter. Generating multiple hypotheses. I am a huge believer in pushing yourself to think about different possibilities. If you think back to that picture of the six pots that I talked about, you know, if you were in a mode where you said, well, let's generate multiple hypotheses of what these are, you could sit down and say, well, they could be this, they could be this, they could be this, they could be this, they could be this. Could be this. You still might miss the pots but you would be pushing yourself to at least consider different possibilities that would force you to look at different aspects, focus on it, reflect on it in different ways. And generating multiple hypotheses actually can be, to, can take very little time. I mean, here on this slide, uh, represented by sticky notes there, you can literally think, what are different explanations of why this is occurring? What are different explanations of where this might go next? Um, I, I think that's a, a habit, a skill, uh, a cultural element uh, that is really worth uh, inculcating uh, in yourself uh, and other folks that can have uh, great value. Uh, next slide, please. Challenging assumptions. Assumptions are a foundation for any analytic assessment or forecast. Sometimes they're explicit, many times they're not. Many times they are implied by judgments, but they're never called out. And so when I was on the red cell, one of the first exercises we almost ever did on an issue engaging with mainline analysts was to sit down and start talking about what are critical assumptions under this judgment? Uh, what are you expecting to continue? What trends do you think are the most important? What are the causal relationships that you think are the most significant uh, in terms of this, this condition? Any and all of those are worthy of exploration. And uh, uh, a, a, a line we, we came to really uh, love is, is you push people on things, you know, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And when someone would say kind of out of exasperation, they'd say, ah, that'll never happen. And you knew the moment they said that phrase, you had yourself an assumption that was probably worth exploring as much or more than anything else because it was resonating to the core of their being say, there's no way that could happen. Now, the fact of the matter is they might well be right on their watch for the time that they're looking at things. But over extended periods of time, under circumstances of change, any and all of those assumptions are worth taking a look at and pushing. Uh, I'm reminded there was a um, rather nefarious uh, authoritarian leader that had uh, engineered a, a, a re-election, and uh, we weighed in and we said, hey, we, we want to uh, explore how they might lose this election. And we were almost laughed out of the room, and it was like, this, this will never happen. There, there's no possibility. They, they control all the media. They control 
all the security services. They've sidelined all the opposition folks. There is no way this person could ever lose this election. We said, you know what? You're probably right. But there are actually a handful of circumstances in history in which this has happened. And in fact, one of them hit very close to home because it was an account I had worked on in some of my first years at the agency in which an authoritarian leader held an election and lost it that no one expected to happen. And so we ended up doing a piece and they said, well, oh, it could only happen if there was sort of a perfect storm of this, 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 this. We laid out these arguments. The election came, the authoritarian leader won the election handily. So we were absolutely wrong. But the analysts themselves came back to us and said, you know, this was one of the best exercises we ever did because it helped us identify some assumptions we didn't even know we were making about these people. And it helped push us to identify some indicators about when and how some of those might erode or go wrong for the leader. We also got some praise from senior members in the intelligence community that said, you know, this is exactly what you need to be doing. Uh, low probability, high risk circumstances where if this had come out in a different way, it would not, it should not be the first time that we're thinking about something like that uh, uh, popping up. Uh, next slide, please. Another technique for generating alternative considerations is to sort of Think about categories by which surprises happen and brainstorm from there. And so here are six, and I, I won't go into all of them here, but you can look, these are sort of patterns of change, patterns of surprises, and you can think of historical circumstances. So the gray rhino, the gray rhino is a nomenclature, it's a title people use for risks that are known and inevitable, but you don't know the timing or circumstance. So something like the COVID pandemic or a financial crisis would be a terrific example because we know the world is hit on a regular basis by financial crises, but we don't know the time or circumstance, or we know Global pandemics happen. There's a whole sordid history of global pandemics ravaging the world, but they happen very sporadically. And so we don't know the time, circumstance, and format of them. And so gray rhinos are risks we know are inevitable, but we don't know the time and circumstance. And so that can be a whole source of brainstorming to think about what are gray rhinos we should think about. In the upper right-hand corner, dark twist, uh, this is one of my favorites because this is a case where their risks were already thinking about, but they erupt in a way that are more intense, more successful, more disruptive, more surprising in terms of their scope and reach than we ever imagined. And I actually think this is one of the most common forms of surprise that we deal with. Two examples I'll give. One is Pearl Harbor. Before Pearl Harbor, opinion polls showed that a majority of Americans believed a US war with Japan was inevitable. U.S. military and political leaders were very concerned, nervous, fearful that a war with Japan was going to take place. And so the fact that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the circumstance, scope, and degree of their success in decimating or destroying much of the Pacific fleet that is what was surprising. But the underlying concern about a war with Japan was actually high on the radar scope. Uh, think again in, the, in, in a more modern era, the 9-11 attacks. We had a whole center devoted to counterterrorism. 
We were worried about Al Qaeda. We were nervous that they were planning an attack. And so the 9-11 attacks, we were already concerned about terrorism, but it was the target, the degree of success, and the disruption, that, uh, the, the, the scope of that, that's what the surprise ended up being. And so sometimes imagining surprises is not thinking about something nobody's ever thought about before. It's actually reflecting on issues you're already worried about and just cranking that dial up to 10 and saying, how could this manifest in itself in ways beyond what we've ever even imagined uh, on that? Uh, the other ones I, I think are, are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, the silver lining ones is an interesting one. Um, if you want to be a serious contrarian in the intelligence community, uh, the most contrarian you can ever be is to be optimistic or positive about anything. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a business as the joke goes. Uh, if an intelligence analyst sees flowers, they look around for the funeral. Uh, they always imagine the worst of something. And so one of the most creative contrarian things you can do is to take an issue and imagine what positive elements might come out of this. Uh, what are upsides? What are opportunities uh, uh, that might emerge from this? And that's something uh, uh, that can be uh, very contrarian. Uh, Peter, let's go with the uh, next slide there. All right, so I've given you a handful of sort of practical suggestions. What are techniques, tools, exercises you can do to kind of stretch your mind, stretch your thinking? The other part of that has to do with the personal, professional, bureaucratic side of this. Okay, smarty pants, you're going to do some alternative analysis. You're going to do some contrarian thinking. How does that happen? How does that happen in an organization uh, what are the impediments? What are the incentives? Uh, what are the realities that you have to deal with? Uh, a couple of to flag here, calibrating expectations. Um, I think you've got to realize that just because you're going to do alternative analysis doesn't guarantee that you're going to forecast all the coming surprises. In fact, you're probably going to still miss a lot of them. Uh, and so a reasonable question you or your supervisors or the larger organization might have might be, okay, so why am I going to do this if I'm not going to anticipate all these uh, uh, big strategic surprises? Well, I think there's a lot of value in expanding your thinking. One is, even if you've missed a surprise, once it erupts, I think the mindset can help you recognize it more quickly that such a significant surprise has happened rather than dismissing or discounting it. Uh, the other thing that we found on the red cell on a fairly regular basis was the surprise we imagined didn't happen, but some interesting twist or variation on it did end up happening at some point down the line. And so it wasn't the exact thing that we talked about, but something like it or similar in that vein. Or you might think about it where the thing that you imagined happening didn't happen, but in preparing for it, it allowed you to prepare for some other disruptions that did happen. And in fact, I, I was having a chat, I was at a conference about a month ago, and there was a, a former US ambassador to uh, Brazil, and he said, uh, oh, we, uh, we decided to do an exercise about uh, a natural disaster and contacting Americans in the country, uh, making arrangements in terms of emergency medical, this, that, or the other. And he says, we did this whole simulation and we did this and we did all of the, the, these things. And a year or two went by. And he said, we had a plane crash that had a whole bunch of Americans on it. And he said, 
almost all the lessons that we learn from our earthquake preparedness drill applied directly in terms of all of the emergency tasks that we needed to take care of that happened when this plane went down. And so sometimes expanding your, your, your perceptions, expanding your expectations, preparing for different possibilities can help you in areas that you haven't even th thought about. Uh, keeping it proportional. I'm a big fan of alternative analysis. Uh, I'm a big fan of thinking about and hunting strategic surprise, but it cannot and should not be the be all end all of your analytic work. Uh, it is something that needs to be part of what you do, but not overwhelming. Uh, uh, the, the metaphor I imagine is, is getting in your car and putting your seatbelt on. It's a fairly simple act. Uh, it's a technology, it's a habit that you can do to prepare for a cataclysmic accident, but proportionately in terms of the time that you spend on it, it's fairly modest in terms of all the other things that you're doing, driving, doing your errands, doing these other things. And so you want to keep these efforts proportional. Uh, these may be low risk, uh, uh, low probability, high risk things. What is the level of effort that's proportional, uh, helpful to that? Uh, integrating it into your regular work. Uh, we had the luxury on the red cell to be a unit solely dedicated to producing alternative analysis, hunting strategic surprise, it was a great job. It was a great uh, 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 challenge. It was a great mission. The reality is most people in most, most organizations don't have that luxury to, uh, uh, to invest in an entire unit or person dedicated to that. And so I think the reality is it's something, how do you integrate that into work that you do on, on other topics? Uh, are these exercises that you run? Are these annual reflections or brainstorms that you do? Uh, one of the things we'd work with liaison uh, uh, um, uh, groups around the world on things, one of the most effective things I saw, uh, and the, the, the NIC, uh, National Intelligence Council, did this from time to time. In a regular assessment, they would embed a simple text box that would say something like, how we might be wrong. You know, here's a key assumption, here are reasons it might be wrong. Th these are some ways that it might turn out differently. And so you have a main paper, a main thesis, a mainline judgment about what you think might be the most probable outcome. And then you're reserving a text box, a page or something to say, uh, you who here is a twist or turn that's worth thinking about. Uh, uh, as you're considering this other, uh, other possibility. Finally, in terms of practical challenges, uh, Peter, if we could go to the, the next slide here. Uh, you know, you'll come up with an interesting story. Hey, think about this possibility. Think about this possibility. It's common for busy, distracted senior decision makers where it's kind of like, okay, this is an interesting story, but what do I do with this? You, you've told me there's a risk that something like this might happen. You know, is it 20% chance? Is it a 30% chance? Is it a 10% chance? What do I do with that knowledge? And so I think in addition to telling the analytics story, it can be helpful to give people a framework. And here I'm imagining sort of a sliding scale from left to right where it has to do with sort of the level of effort, level of investment that's going from little to, to a lot. You know, is this something that warrants more research? Is this something that should be discussed more broadly uh, as, a, as a thought exercise? Is this something where we should identify indicators that we should track over time to see whether or not the odds of this are increasing? Is this something that warrants a simulation exercise? Let's get people together. Let's go through this. Let's think about this possibility. Uh, contingency planning, uh, hedging investments in terms of modest, major, you know, a, a, a fundamental shift. Oh my God, we think the risk of this is so high. We ought to be turning our organization in, in a different way. That's probably going to be a pretty rare circumstance on that front. 
But the framework is designed in a way to give people some guidance and latitude in terms of what do I do with this? Well, where do we go with that? And I think with that, uh, if we go to the next slide, I'm all done uh, yammering at you. And uh, we can move on to some questions here. Michael, if that's all right. Great, Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, very engaging presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, food for thought here. Let's talk about a few things, though. And when we talk about alternative analysis, I know sometimes um, that uh, phrase is not um, sat well with some people, but uh, why an alternative? Why are we using that word? Is that a good word to be using? Or does that put put this type of thinking in a, in a separate box? Yeah, I, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think they're good points. And I think in an ideal ideal world, we could get to the point where if analysis was so built around multiple hypotheses, the concept of alternative analysis might actually go away. And we, and we just say analysis is about thinking about a range of possible outcomes. My impression is for most organizations, for most analysts, we're not there yet. And so we live in a world in which there are mainline judgments. Uh, there's a mainline analytic line uh, in terms of what people think uh, is going to happen. There is a conventional wisdom for better or worse about things that are going to happen. And so I think in that realm, uh, talking about alternative, uh, I, I think the intent is to say, hey, you've got judgments about things. They're probably good. They're probably well thought out. And in a lot of circumstances, they may well be right, but dot, 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 mm -hmm. twists and turns happen, surprises occur. And so let's think about alternatives or, or whatnot. And so um, it, it, it's a nomenclature. There are concepts that are, are, are right for discussion and debate. And, and for me, uh, I guess the labels are less important than the concept of expanding perceptions, expanding the circle of plausibility. As a shorthand, I think alternative analysis works. Sometimes I think it can be restrictive if folks think of it in too narrow a technical way. You can have things like analysis of competing hypotheses as a structured analytic technique. Uh, that can be a good and timely exercise in some circumstances. It's fairly stylized. It's pretty formal. It's fairly labor intensive. Uh, my intent is, you know, if you want to do that, that's fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. But the hope is there is a wider set of things that you can do as well. Uh, you may do that from time to time, but if something erupts, you know, the notion of multiple hypotheses is something you can do at your desk in 30 minutes to say, hey, what are five different ways I could explain what just happened in Ukraine? Um, you know, it's easier as an individual now, I mean, both of us are not working in the intelligence community now, but to sit back and kind of feel like freer, you know, to think about issues yes. um, and not have, you know, and not feel the weight of institutional mainline analysis or something like that, right? But I mean, you have to come up with a consensus opinion. You have to come up with some type, you offering the policymakers something. This is what we think as an institution, right? This is our, it gives it a, the judgment authority. But so, and you alluded to this earlier about how analysts had thought the exercise of going through um, this alternative analysis on an authoritarian uh, leader losing an election was very useful, um, which may actually, I was wondering, yeah, that could be a, somewhat of an unusual reaction, given uh, the, given yeah. how uh, my experience has been with uh, institutions accepting alternative viewpoints on these things. Yeah. Generally, we found policymakers were surprisingly open to the idea of alternative analysis. Uh, they thought it was intriguing that it was done. I think they had a sense that it was a healthy thing to do. I think 
I think some uh, unfortunately found it sort of a source of entertainment and diversion uh, mm -hmm. at, at times. I think some liked it because it gave us latitude to look more strategically at, at some issues. And so on the policymaker front, we found most of the time people were surprisingly receptive uh, to it and sometimes wildly enthusiastic uh, uh, about it and would then come and ask us questions, task us, think about this, challenge me on this, blah, blah, blah. Among an fellow analysts, there was oftentimes sort of an evolution where initially it started in a fairly defensive crouch who are you people? Why are you coming in on my issue? You don't know this issue as well as I do. We have sensitive information that you don't even know about. And so there was a, a, a bit of a, a, a palm to the face where it was like, hey, back off. You know, who do you guys think you are? Uh, very, very natural. Human nature, bureaucratic politics, very, very natural. We would try to come in and say, look, we're not trying to pretend that we're experts. We're trying to push and expand how we're thinking about this. Um, sometimes the resistance never went away uh, on things. Uh, uh, in the best cases, folks would come around and say, OK, as in the case of the authoritarian uh, election, was like, look, we don't think this is going to happen. But if you're going to make this argument, this is the best counter argument you can make. Mm -hmm. And that was just wonderful. Uh, or, or we encountered an analyst one time that came to us and said, you know what? I just wrote a whole paper on why X might happen. Worked on it for six months, put it out. It's a landmark piece. I now want to come to the red cell and write why, why I might be wrong. And those are the times where you just, it's like, oh my gosh, this, this is someone with the instinct, with the reflex, with the expansiveness uh, to think broadly, challenge their own thinking. Uh, and, and the reality for a lot of analysts is that they wanted to do alternative analysis but they were simply so busy, the press of business in terms of tasking, events, review, production, things like that, people would, would sort of, uh, it, it was like, oh man, we wish we could do more of this. We just don't have time. I recently had a conversation with a, a former analyst now, uh, a well-known writer on intelligence issues and historian who said he he tried he tried a, a Didison at the Red Cell and he felt he was terrible at it. He didn't feel like he no. uh, he was a good analyst, but he didn't feel like he was a good Red Cell analyst. So on that, uh, that'll be my last question. Just an idea, getting building on that point. Um, why would that? Why would somebody not be successful at it? Yeah, I I think. Uh sort of the qualities for good alternative analysis, I think you've got to be curious. You've just got to come to things and have a mind where your instinct is to ask questions rather than to necessarily come up with an ex explanation for it. I think some element of creativity and finding links or parallels between things that might not naturally be uh, uh, connected by other people. Um, I think having a storytelling uh, uh, capacity is very powerful in which alternative analysis usually doesn't rest on a single fact as much as it's the ability to paint sort of a vibrant, credible picture of something that is persuasive enough where somebody goes, wow, okay. That actually doesn't seem that crazy. Maybe something like that could happen. Uh, and, and so that ability to tell stories uh, 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 is a good one. The other thing, uh, being tenacious, thick-skinned, uh, in the face of resistance, in the face of pushback, in the face of long review and, and skepticism about this or that, 
keeping at it, we had some pieces where we might push six, eight, 10, 12 months. And quite literally, there were times when I think people just thought, well, if we try to resist them long enough, they'll just give up and go away. And I think one of the things from my legacy was to convince people, you cannot out, you cannot outweigh weight me. Uh, I will keep going at this. And uh, we got some pieces out that uh, uh, despite uh, a significant pushback. Let me uh, go to some of the questions from our guest today. Um, so uh, we did it and we did Inside Intelligence on chat GPT uh, a month ago or so. Um, what do you think about this uh, role of chat GPT or other large language models might have in red cell exercises or AI and red cell exercises? You see this as an aid? Uh, yes, most definitely as an aid. It is fascinating. I, I've been at some conferences, done some poking around uh, online. I am stunned at the level of capability already. And so I think if analysts are not thinking about how this is going to be part of their work, uh, they're seriously behind the, the, the times. And so I think in some ways, thinking about it as an analytic aid and, and, and uh, uh, provocateur is a good one, where it may be you're posing questions to see it, what it comes up with as a way to compare, well, this is what I was thinking about. It's got different arguments that's coming up. Uh, it may be also a way to generate multiple hypotheses where you give these multiple hypotheses to chat GPT. And you know, me on my own, it might be a sticky note on my whiteboard chat GPT. It may be wiring that up and it's like, I've got a page thesis for every one of my multiple hypotheses. Uh, and, and so I think an aid in the sense, not with the expectation that it's giving you the answer, but it may be stretching you to think about things and possibilities that you haven't thought of before. Now, I think the extra credit round might be going through all the chat GPT uh, 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 options that are out there and saying, what is it not thinking about? Because in essence, it's deriving its material from the wide body of text and, and, and production that's out and available on the internet. And so in its, in its own way, it's going to have potential blind spots or things that it's not considering as well. So I think the concept of an aid, assistant, uh, something to check against uh, is a really good mindset for this tool. And, and I commend folks who, who are poking down this, this road already. I'm gonna rephrase a question from David a little bit. Um, we, we, you raised cognitive biases and group think and things like that the, uh, uh, earlier. Um, do you think that that is a fair thing to say, maybe contributed to the inability to spot something like a big dark twist, if you will, like the Arab Spring? or is there other uh, factors involved? Yeah, I'm, I'm not in a, in a position in, uh, because I wasn't working on those issues or reviewed all those materials. I'm always skeptical to, to be seen as sort of an official uh, grader or critiquer of, of US intelligence community things. I think writ large, it is safe to say that it, it, we frequently miss things when there is not a recent precedent for it. And so if you look at the Arab countries and you look at the history of leadership and the domination of authoritarian leaders and things like that, you could go back long periods of time and say, hey, these guys have been riding for a long period of time with disruption. And moreover, it's really hard to find a historical precedent in which trouble in one place ends up igniting trouble all through the rest of the region. Right. And, and if you are an Arab scholar out there, I suspect you probably know of a good exception to say, oh, well, in 1140 or, or this, uh, they may be out there. 
uh, uh, that, that I'm not aware of uh, in terms of my knowledge, uh, limited knowledge on, on the region, but it has not, as best I understand, happened in the modern era in the last 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years. And so if you were going to look at that situation and say, hey, is this trouble in, in Tunisia going to ignite in all of these other countries, uh, just going on the precedence of the last 20, 30, 40 years, you'd probably say, nope, doesn't, doesn't seem, seem likely. Um, one of our, uh, you've, one of our uh, uh, listeners talked about, you know, uh, Talib's book, The Black Swan, it's one of the first things people think about, is um, what, do you, what about his approach to this, uh, that uh, these events that are singularly disruptive and change the course of history. Do you find his analysis persuasive? Yes, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a fan of, of, of Taleb's uh, uh, in that I, I think it is a great provocation uh, in terms of pushing us to recognize, and, and, and it's funny, uh, it actually tends to get me in a little bit of trouble uh, because in a pedantic way, I, I'd be invited to things and they'd have some sort of exercise and they say, well, we're going to have uh, an exercise about black swans. So we're going to have a brainstorm to identify black swans. I'd say, well, it's good. I think I understand your intent here, but I think you may miss the concept of black swan because the idea of black swan is if you think of it, it's not a black swan. And so his reminder, so, so his, his suggestion is, you need to think about these things, but the cautionary tale is, there's always gonna be something you didn't think of. And I think that is a true and humbling insight for analysts to always remember. Now, in some of his later work, I think he, has done a really good job in terms of identifying <clears throat> concentration and homogeneity as signs of particular risks. And so like my aunt and uncle lived in Dubuque, Iowa and Dubuque, Iowa was known as a town with beautiful trees, Dutch elm trees. And then 20, 30 some years ago, Dutch elm disease came along and it killed Dutch elms. Well, if you had an occasional Dutch elm around, you just lost a few trees. Dubuque essentially lost almost every tree they had in the city because they decided to go all in on Dutch elms because they were such beautiful trees. Now, Taleb's reflection on that would be to say, you know, that homogeneity, you don't have to be a tree expert. You don't have to forecast to say, oh, there's going to be a Dutch elm disease and it's going to hit in this year. What you can say is the more homogeneous, the more concentrated something is, the more risk there is, something could go catastrophically wrong if it's all the same. I think that's a really wonderful principle uh, that, that you can apply in a lot of uh, different ways. So I, yeah. I, I, I won't cite every chapter and verse and everything Taleb has ever read and, and said and, and written on things, but I think the spirit of his reflection about the world surprising us uh, in unexpected ways is, is a very healthy reminder. Uh, we'll go quick takes on a few of these uh, so we can wrap up because we're mindful of the time. Uh, sure. One thing, Jay, about what about super forecasting? It seems to me, as a first blush, it's really not, it's not necessarily the same concept as alternative analysis. Or what do you think? I'm impressed at the, at the concept of super forecasting. And I think actually uh, uh, the intelligence community and all uh, might, might learn and incorporate more of its elements. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's really geared towards most likely outcomes right. and it's showing that people can have above average forecasting skills 
for most likely outcomes. And so I think there's a value there, uh, but there will also be times in which it's wrong. And, and so it's in, in terms of that, that balance part of your work, it's like, yes, you could invest in super forecasting, but you would also want to be thinking about other possibilities as well. But even the super forecasters aren't so good that you shouldn't be thinking about some alternatives. Right. There seems like it seems like a, a more refined version of normal theory. I mean, mm. that, yeah. you know that that uh, you're trying to be a better uh, better idea of normal theory anyway. But um, which by, works most of the time. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, what do you? What advice would you give then to young new analysts who are looking to question pre-established practices? Yeah, it can be hard if you're part of an organization and there are older folks or a lot of folks around and seniority or this or that. Uh, I think asking questions uh, is one of the best ways in which you can challenge thinking uh, in a professional and constructive uh, sort of way. Um, uh, I think... Um, floating ideas or uh, uh, it, it, it may be something where internally in the form, I, I mean, when in, in the work world, I, I knew emails were sort of uh, uh, the platform by which a lot of ideas and considerations went back and forth well apart in parallel from formal production. And so it may be beyond questions and suggestions where you float some uh, uh, potential hypotheses to say, you know, uh, I always found that a fair degree of humility and a sense of like, look, I know the odds are against this or the odds may be low or this or that, but is it worth considering the possibility that such and such a thing might happen? Or that we, you know, here here's a possibility that we need to be at least considering uh, on on this. In terms of style and uh, uh, the, the way that, that 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 you do that, I mean, another another possibility. If you really feel like you're getting squashed uh, by other folks in the organization, uh, if there's any way in the way of a trusted supervisor or colleague or someone that you can go to and say, hey, um, you know, I'm raising some ideas or I'm raising some concerns or some other uh, possibilities we need to be thinking about, and these are getting dismissed. Uh, that's something that, that's worthy of, of raising beyond. But it's I, I don't want to diminish uh, culturally, organizationally, that can be hard. I have seen it firsthand uh, where folks and, and, and a lot of you know, older or senior analysts or this or that, they may not even realize the extent to which the strength of their views is displacing or discouraging alternatives. Right. I think it's great uh, advice, especially for young analysts. Ask, ask the questions. Um, don't be afraid to think out of the box. But be, one has to be also uh, be show some you know prudential wisdom too about um, how often you how often you do that uh, when you're just joining a new organization. Uh, this was a really fantastic discussion, Jay. Listen, uh, um, wish we could get to every question in the chat. Great dialogue going on in the chat. Thanks for everybody's contributions to that. Um, we hope that we'll be able to follow up, Jay. I'd like you to. Come back sometime again as a guest. Um, we have uh, next month uh, Matt Burroughs of the National Intelligence Council, formerly of the National Intelligence Council, now with the Stimson Center, will be talking about Global Futures 2030. That'll be on Jan uh, uh, excuse me, June 14th, same time as usual at uh, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. So we look forward to that. Um, and uh, thanks again, Jay, for a great discussion today. Uh, Michael, thanks to you, Peter, uh, all the folks who checked in. Uh, greatly appreciate your uh, time and attention. It's uh, been fun. Thank you very much. All right. Take care.